we are off. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, good evening, wherever you're, you're calling from. Uh, great to have you on board with us this afternoon. Um, if you just please bear in mind uh, to keep your microphone on mute, you can use the, the chat box uh, as our previous webinars. Ricardo and my co-host will be monitoring that. Uh, I'm delighted that we've got um, Derek O'Reardon and John Fletcher joining us this afternoon to talk all things decision making. Um, and I'm just going to give uh, them an opportunity to introduce themselves formally. So Derek, we'll start off with you, pal. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for having me on, Bobby. Um, uh, I'm obviously a, a coach, a rugby coach uh, by trade, and a coach developer that works across uh, a number of sports within the the system in Scotland. Uh, primarily golf, uh, golf, football. I've done a, a wee bit with basketball and triathlon as well. Uh, and in the day job, I work with uh, with a number of sports to help them develop their coaching systems, which includes coach education, coach development. Uh, I also work with our institute around how we can support the development of performance coaches. So what does that, their learning look like? Wait for me, uh, uh, and, uh, and yeah, that, that's me. Over to, over to Fletcher, I suppose. Uh, thanks. Uh, and again, Bobby, thanks for the opportunity, mate. So John Fletcher, um, sport would be rugby. So I spent a lot of time in rugby around both the academy and performance level, as in the first team stuff. Uh, recently, over 10 years within the performance programme within England Rugby. Uh, recently, I started a company called The Magic Academy with Russell Earnshaw, aka Rusty, and The Magic Stig. Um, moved off the grass more and more and sort of on to supporting coaches. So a bit of mentoring, um, helping some individual, helping some teams just around make some sense around, around coaching. That's me. Awesome. Thanks both. And uh, originally we did have a, a football uh, coach on with us, with us, but today we've got two rugby coaches, but I think there's some uh, great parallels between, between handball and rugby, but more specifically around what we're going to get into around the, the coaching, uh, coaching stuff in terms of coaching behaviours and how we design sessions and, and such. But um, we really wanted to start off with uh, move the slides on. Um, why have we chosen decision making chaps? I might just uh, open it up to you guys in a minute, but I, I come across three kind of uh, quotes around decision making and adaptability uh, in sport. One from Lionel Messi, one from John Wooden, the legendary basketball coach, and one, my favourite one, I suppose, out of these three is from, from Keith Davids, uh, which Fletch actually had on a slide at our England Handball AGM last year. You can't adapt to an environment that you don't inhabit, which really got me thinking about how we are designing our sessions. Are we creating sessions that can um, encourage you know, these decision-making opportunities? And, and are we really in tune with that stuff? So, chaps, anything on why why do we think decision-making is like the, um, I don't know, a key aspect of what we should be putting our learners through? Happy for Flex to open up on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, your sport is a decision-making sport. Um, thousands, tens of thousands of decisions will be happening through um but as they're playing the games clearly you want to replicate that within the training environment so it's as and when they get to the game it's um yeah things are sort of feeling a little bit more comfortable because they've experienced it in the past i mean that's fundamentally what what it is is that your practice your training and your practice design is is there to be helpful and to help you have better performances and then depending on what environment you're in to go on and and have success whatever success means I suppose just just to add to that, quite simply for me, adaptability is a competitive advantage, uh, and our ability to make uh, effective decisions relative to what we might see on court uh, gives us uh, the edge over a team who may be physically equal or physically dominant over us. Our ability to make uh, effective decisions on court might be uh, the point of difference around uh, having competitive advantage or not. Cool. Um, so today we have trying to move the slides on again. We're going to try to experiment with some polls uh, that we haven't done before. So uh, right now, we're going to ask you guys to think about um, how much time you dedicate to your decision-making practices in your session. So I'm going to start off with trying to launch this one. It might even give you the second one. But if you guys can take some time just to think about how much percentage you're dedicating in your sessions, uh, I'll give you guys 30 seconds or so on this. Um, 
we've got some examples from other sports in terms of what they might be doing as well. So that could be interesting for us to, to take a look at. Can you guys see the poll? Let's... I think everyone can see it, but yeah. um, uh, I'm, at least from my end, I can't seem to be able to choose one of any of the options. Okay, I can see people um, engaging on it now. Okay. So that's cool. Just I think you've got to answer all three questions before you can submit. Ah, uh, okay, okay, cool. Then that just gives us something for a bit later on. Let me give you guys another 20 seconds on this. We're getting a real nice healthy spread across the, the percentages, so that's yeah. cool. Okay, we're gonna stop that in a couple of seconds. Okay, I might be able to restart the poll uh, shortly. Uh, if we need to look at the other questions but so just on that one chaps we've got in the lead it's probably 40 percent of the time is dedicated to session session design uh, sorry into decision making so i'm just going to share my screen with you guys now this is a study that was done this year uh, across four countries in europe on youth academy football and how much time coaches are spending um, on decision making practices and we can see that uh, Portugal is way up with almost 70%, Spain just below, and then just below 60% is England and Germany, which for me is, is, was a bit of a, um, a revelation. I work in academy football, and I've seen some, some, uh, some really good stuff happening, but I had no idea that those kind of figures would be kind of mentioned. Fletch and, and Derek, have you got any comments on, on this at the moment? I mean, Fletch, we, I've spoken to you briefly about this stuff. Um, what would you expect in, in those sort of performance environments? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, it would be up towards the 70 plus uh, would be ideal. I would have thought anything below that. You probably need to have a look at your practice design, how you're designing the practice. Uh, what is non-active decision making? I, I think some people might be curious to, to what that language means, mate. Do you want to explain that? Sure, yeah. So those were practices where there was um, not one decision was being made, so there was no choice in the practice. It was very much a repetitive movement pattern. We might call it blocks practice or isolated practice. So it might be developing their, um, their, their passing skills, their 1v1 skills, um, but that no decision in the moment. So there's maybe ball manipulation, that type of stuff. Yeah, and again, I, I've summed it to you. I've done some work in football. I can just share what I've noticed. Uh, I think that would be often at the start of the session. So actually how we start the sessions, what I've probably noticed, I think a high of the a higher amount of the non-active decision making would probably come at the start where we feel as though that's a good way to start training sessions. So that's definitely something that I've noticed. Um, I mean, I would be urging and pushing coaches to think about how they're actually going to start, or what you want the start of the session to, to look like. And clearly, you would want that uh, that red column, the active decision making. You you know, you would want that much higher, up towards minimum seventy percent. But even that's pretty low. Eric, just for the sake of some balance. Sorry, Fletch, did you were you finished? Yeah, I was, mate. Yeah. Derek, for for the sake of balance, Fletch is obviously saying about pushing the the numbers up more towards seventy percent. Um, what would you say would be the trade offs if we're if we're going up that way? What might we be losing? It's it's uh, not necessarily the the, the trade off. I mean, I remember in in the early stages of of my coaching career asking how do I how do I build more effective decision makers, uh, and somebody just gave a gave a really neat nugget to me around you, well you've got to put decision making on steroids within the context of your environment, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they've got to make decisions in game, but they've got to make decisions around what the makeups of the team look like, what does a warm up look like who's doing the water, what, who are the duty teams, and instead of you having to instruct, uh, you're, you're basically inviting a view uh, from the group uh, to inform how that decision is made. And, and I'd probably add, uh, within that 60, 70% in, in Spain and Portugal, what I would want to understand is, uh, are they making decisions for decisions' sake? sake? And actually, uh, what's being done around the quality of those decisions? Because you might have sessions where there's active decision making taking place but how often are those decisions being audited 
not necessarily to make sure they're the right one, uh, but just to check and challenge the, the level of cognition that sits behind the decisions that athletes are making. Um, Eric, could, could, that, could, yeah. could you give me some examples how you would do that? It's that it's that whole um, reflection on action in action for action. So I've seen some stuff that 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 you and and Rusty do, uh, where you might pause a session and just ask a question as to why they've done a certain thing, uh, yeah. and if and if uh, an athlete's able to provide or or a player's able to provide some pretty sound rationale for making that decision, irrespective of the outcome, uh, you respect the decision making process, right? Uh, because that enables them or empowers them to make more decisions more often. Yeah, and again, I, I think maybe in a, something similar, maybe in a slight building that, actually pause and ask somebody else why they think that person's made the decision because clearly shared, shared decision-making or shared affordances is, is the stuff that is really, is really important. Often the player and the coach are having a good conversation, but the other people involved in that decision-making process. Uh, um, that, that, that's a really good point, Fletcher, around developing shared mental models, so a degree of coherence across the team around how we might make those decisions collectively and independently uh, uh, in response to a performance problem that we might see within the game. Yeah, so, so for those coaches who are using freezing and pausing and, and trying to sort of check in with, um, you know, you know w w with the why, I, I do think we tend to go to the, to the person who's been directly involved with the action. I think it would be also useful to check in with the people who are indirectly involved with the action, probably those closest or maybe even from a defensive point of view. So if an attack has done something, what actually have the defence noticed? So they aren't necessarily directly involved. But so just be mindful of why you why you would use something like a freeze or a pause or to or to sort of check in around the decision making process. Yeah, I, I think just just to build on that, Fletch, because that's a really nice point. One of the questions that we may ask or probably could ask is just around what specifying information was there for them to make that decision. Um, so then they're not just drawing something out of a playbook. Uh, actually, the and that's a really really neat point that you made around asking maybe the defence or the the offensive side of the ball as to w why they believe they made that decision. It's really around um, that uh, ability for people to recognise what's in front of them. Uh, that's where you want the decisions to, to 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 come from. Ultimately, is in response to um, an affordance, as you said, or a picture that's been that been laid out in front of them. Um, so that's a really nice point. And again, mate, and, and um, I don't mean to build on a build, and I'm definitely not going to use that language. But it's, <laughs> um, and, and I think Rusty does this really well. Rusty will also ask, and what else? You know, yeah. because there would be multiple uh, opportunities, for not only to try and understand what, what, what the sort of current thinking was, but actually what else, what else, what else, what else, right, go play type stuff. I think that's also a shout out. I'm not sure if he's on the call, but. I think Rusty would do that really well. Would sort of stretch within that moment of, you know, if you've used that that um, that freeze or that pause or something similar to actually utilise that time well. Yeah, and I think that that's consistent. I think in some sports that I've worked in, specifically a sport like basketball, and I see it a lot in handball, where you've got a set motion or a set move that's building up to a shot. Uh, but quite often within that motion, a shot's opened up three or four times. Uh, but they're not looking for that specifying information because uh, there is no decision to be made when they're operating within within a scheme uh, or a system. Uh, and I suppose just to lean on that a wee bit, uh, uh, Bobby, is uh, to what extent do we afford uh, freedom within within the structure to go out of structure, to go out of system, uh, when we recognise uh, there is a decision to be made and a shot to be played? That's a, a, a great question, um, Derek, and obviously I can't speak on behalf of the whole handball community. Um, I might bring Ricardo in to speak about it from the GB men's perspective. Uh, Ricardo's our GB national team coach. Um, t tell us about what happens in, in your training, Ricardo. How do you build the decision-making into set plays? Well, it's all about um, setting scenarios that allow them to make mistakes and to reflect on them whilst they're doing it. Uh, you try not to, it's like posing questions. You try, you try to make them as open as possible. And when you set practice aimed at working some specific tactical model, what, what I'm looking for is to use a trigger that then will offer multiple options. Uh, and those options are choice, are, are chosen, uh, taking into account all the factors that in, inform their decisions, as in position of, of the opposition and in relation towards the goal, moment of the game, and whatever. So. What I'm trying to do is to keep, although I have a final goal, the path to that goal is for me, 
as open as possible, uh, trying to allow uh, for them to make mistakes and to, to feel that vulnerability that will, you know, make them think and reflect on what they've just done and what are what would be the better options for them. Hopefully, that will improve their decision ability. Yeah, and again, I, and, and look, I mean, some stuff for people to consider is is within that more structured or that more stable environment, and and there's and there's advantages to to having having set plays and having some stuff that people have some clarity around. But even then, you want to create some some uh, some some things that are not certain, so some uncertain situations w uh, within that. Um, you know, so things like giving false information, actually deliberately not running it well. Um, so what I've noticed about when people get into structured stuff, they don't, in my view, often it they don't add enough instability and uncertainty within it. It's often, it always works. It kind of works like this. The defense or, or, or the attack, depending on which way you want to do it, is, um, yeah, it's probably not posing the questions that they're going to have in the game. So structure and, and framework is clearly going to be useful and it's going to be helpful. However, even within that, there's going to be multiple, multiple options and multiple opportunities and decisions within that. And how we design in our practice, what I've noticed is once we get into the structured stuff, we're still not designing through our practice enough instability so the players can actually make a slightly... So I might, in the practice, I might be going top left, but actually the bottom right's open and... As a coach, you might want to deliberately create that situation. It's, yeah. um, it's quite interesting for me to hear a lot of the, the language being used at the moment is, is um, getting into this kind of the coach behaviours. So I'm going to move on to the, the how uh, bit. Maybe we could be a bit more, um, I don't know, explicit or break this. The, the how can we promote decision making a bit more? Because I'm hearing things like um, allow players to do X, allow players to do Y. And it's really, you know, for me, a big emphasis on the role of the coach in this so first of all perhaps we might have a look at what things might be holding back coaches from promoting the decision making through Derek and, and Fletch your experiences of um, working with coaches over the years what have been the biggest barriers for coaches to, to um, yeah, get the, promote the decision making within their teams um, just that they would probably want it to work more often. So they're in their brains, they're probably sort of thinking, look, I think a, 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 I think a good environment would be a high success rate. Um, you clearly would probably want less success at the start and for them to search and find the information that's going to be helpful. So often the starts of sessions are not messy enough or chaotic enough or there's not enough stuff that they've kind of, they've got to work it out so i think how people start people would tend to start the other way they would want to make it relatively successful and then yeah that's the stuff that that i've noticed um probably a little bit also around i mean my preference would be to coach to outcomes a bit so set some outcomes and then actually allow more opportunity for the players to explore now that might be through some structure and some framework um, but maybe set the outcomes and let the players just have have more freedom to try and get the outcome. So if the outcome is, well, in this practice, we want to score X number of goals or certain types of goals, well, maybe just set the outcome. Uh, I think we're too rigid with the, with, the per, with the parameters that we set often. And I come back to my first point is often we don't start the session. We, we just want too much success too early. And I don't think that's helpful. Okay. Uh, Derek, anything to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe point at a at a work worked example of that. Um, so the, the way in which I I conduct my work at times is I I would arrive with a camera, um, video a coach's session uh, and generate some data within, uh, within a a framework of observable observable behaviours, uh, that I will then look to generate some feedback for the coach. So some of those behaviours that we look for, uh, might be around uh, how they question. So. Uh, do their questions converge on a yes or no answer or are they relatively divergent so they're promoting reflection within the athlete but also to what extent are they responding to questions from the athlete so uh, to what extent is the is the athlete engaged in that learning activity uh, and therefore questioning and sense making with the coach um, and if I if I give an example of a, of a football uh, environment that I've, I've been working in recently 
Um, we we had a coach that said, yeah, I'm, I'm really good at developing decision makers. I ask lots of questions. Now, when you code up the session and 80% of their questions are, are convergent, i.e. the response is either yes or no, then that tells me that, yes, you ask quite a lot of questions, but the questions aren't effective enough in developing decision making. Now, within the divergent questions that they asked, and there were some really, really powerful ones, I'm able to set a timer as to how much time and space uh, the coach affords the athlete to reflect upon that question and then appropriate a response. Uh, and I was able to uh, provide the coach evidence that it, uh, on average it was 0 0.3 seconds he was waiting. And when he didn't receive a response, he was providing the answer. Now, a uh, developing decision makers isn't necessarily all about the way in which you design your practice but it's the way in which you behave as a coach and sometimes we've got to be really comfortable with uncertainty and silence because silence is a space where uh, people's ability to make decisions begins to emerge um, because people start developing cognitions uh, or, or um, representations of how they might apply a performance solution to a performance problem and sometimes they just need the space to figure that out so that they can make that decision more effectively next time around. But does that make sense? Is that consistent with you, Fletch? Yeah, absolutely right. I think what I'm taking from that is, is that you're, if you don't have that approach, you're constrained into how much you know. So, yeah. can, so, so the players are going to be constrained by your, by your knowledge and your experiences and your skill level. And uh, yeah, quite frankly, if, you know, if people are as good at rugby as what I was, then, then yeah, that's not that good. Um, so yeah, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, that's a that's a frightening um, stat, isn't it? That that on average it's a 0.3 of a second wait before we actually interrupt or intervene or interject. Um, it's yeah. clearly not only preventing possible better decision making, but also around the creativity. Yeah. yeah, and I think we talked about this on Monday about the writing reflex, as in R I G H T, uh, and and our propensity or our desire within our knowledge base to. Um, to almost um, impose our knowledge onto other people. And therefore, the, the knowledge that they need to make decisions is constructed by somebody else. Uh, and what we need to be doing is support them to construct the knowledge for themselves because then their, their appreciation and their depth of understanding around uh, the performance solution that they've created to a performance problem is, is tenfold, it's magnified and it's retained. Uh, the level of, of retention and transfer from training into performance, if I'm providing the solutions, is minimal, which is why I really like this idea of, 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 of messiness. So a messy practice that doesn't look very good in general uh, translates into, into really robust performance. And I think you'd probably uh, uh, agree with me on that, on that, Fletch, based on what you've seen in your experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, my preference is just to call it dynamic. I think it would sit better. It would probably tie into a little bit of stuff around the dynamic systems. But when people go messy and chaotic, I'm like, oh, right, thanks, great. I would say that as a compliment. However, in my head, I'm just thinking it's a dynamic. It, there's, some, there's some dynamism going on here. And, yeah, I'm, I'm here to help the, help the individuals in the group search for the information that's going to help them solve the problem. That's my, that's my role. Um, depending on the constraints, at times I might actually, I might actually nudge them or decide to tell them some information. But often I wouldn't. I would just, I would back myself of having some other skills around guiding them. And I think guide is a really useful word, facilitating guide around coaching is around guiding them to the information that's going to help them solve the problem, which is, which is, you know, fundamentally, it's kind no, of for sure. decision making is. Guys, if I may ask a question, um, just to in underpinning uh, some of the ideas that were on the chat. Uh, there's obviously a, a pattern of connection between the, the, the perception of self-efficacy self from the coaches and their willingness to show what they know. Uh, at the same time, the fear they have of, uh, uh, of that the athletes might think they don't know anything because they're asking too much. Um, what would be your advice in, in this uh, side of how we promote decision making to a coach that it's actually willing to do so, but had, has all those anchors, all those fears that could be dragging him and keeping him stuck in that notion of, say, using a, a bit more dictator uh, behavior when it when he's in his sessions. Yeah, I think I mean from my point of view, it's around the coach sort of um, a create an environment where people feel safer, and we, we can go on. That would probably be a different seminar, but definitely around um, them just being a bit vulnerable. So generally asking questions that they don't know the answer to, 
generally actually saying things, well, I actually don't know the answer to this, or is there a better way of doing it? Or um, So having that, either that type of language and that type of intent, I think would be really useful. And for it to be genuine. So don't say you don't know stuff when you actually do know stuff. But the players will, all the time, they're sort of, they're, they're getting a sense about what type of coach you, you are, really. Um, so you're getting your feedback as a coach based on how they're going to behave. So if they're behaving like answering your questions as in finishing off the sentence or telling you what you think they want to hear, that's actually feedback for the environment that you've helped create as a coach. So, so yeah, and it, yeah, some of it would come down to just having a, a really frank and open conversation about actually what we want this environment to be. But then make sure your behaviours then support what you say. You know, so I hear lots of people who say lots of cool stuff, but then unfortunately I see some stuff that's probably slightly different. So what you say and what you do need to be better connected. And ideally, and that's why, you know, people such as myself and Derek exist, get some support from some other coaches to give you feedback. Coaches, um, far too many coaches are like, they, they just really fear other coaches observing them and giving them feedback. And I think it's really weird because the environment they're trying to create with their players is this an amazing environment where people are getting better and they're challenging high support. But far too often, I don't know what you you find, Derek, and clearly the, you know, there'd be some coaches who are, who are all over getting better, but there is actually quite a lot of coaches. Often I find it more so in performance that are, yeah. that are probably not, you know, I probably challenge them on their ability to get better. Yeah, yeah, and um, I think one of the one of the problems that we that we have certainly within the the high performance space uh, and performance space is that coaching practice often goes unchallenged. So we we have a view or a belief of what what we think coaching effectiveness is based on our own internal representations of what we believe it to be. Um, but quite often, when we ask somebody to substantiate and justify why that is effective, um, they really struggle to articulate why. I do this is because this is the way it's always been done or this is the way I've been coached. Rather than there are many different approaches uh, out there to sports coaching. Uh, and if we are really in the interest of working with our athletes and meeting them with, where they are, we may need to lean into one approach or the other or a number of approaches relative to what their needs are. And that might be that we, we adopt an ecological approach at times and it might be at times we need to instruct a bit more. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with a coach um, uh, uh, being... Uh, not necessarily discursive, but um, but using many different approaches to drive their athletes on, uh, because no two athletes are the same, uh, no two coaching sessions are the same, uh, and no two contexts are the same. And so we need to have uh, a number of tools, a number of approaches, a number of ways of attacking uh, attacking coaching in our armory uh, uh, to be able to work with the athletes that we're working with. And if I can just pick up on on the word vulnerability. Um, I think that you that you brought out Fletch uh, that um, it, it's okay for coaches to uh, feel like they don't know everything. Um, uh, players are very attuned to picking up on coaches that uh, are working on impression management uh, and trying to put out all that they know uh, uh, in the hope that they find out uh, that the athletes don't find out all that they don't know, right? But but in, in essence, it's it's perfectly fine because. If you look at this um, this approach to developing decision makers and this the coach working with the athletes to find performance solutions and co-creating and generating knowledge together, that is the richest form uh, of 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 coaching in in my view, um, and it's the stickiest form of coaching in my view because it's less uh, do as I say, uh, and it's more we're all in in this together. We're de developing autonomy. We're leading into self determination theory here uh, around relatedness and autonomy. Uh, and the, the level of impact uh, and power that has on uh, the way in which athletes lean into you as a coach, but also perform on the, on the court is, uh, is crucially important, I think. Some interesting um, stuff there, Derek, on the, um, the co-creation bit and the relatedness, self-determination theory aspect. And there's that, um, that, that quote, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. That just jumped into my mind when you were talking about that stuff. Um, chaps, I just want to, maybe if we can, uh, maybe it's a completely separate uh, webinar altogether, but um, this idea around methodologies and, and different types of approaches to um, designing the session, we've already thrown out some words like ecological approach and um, isolated practice. Um, 
that there's, there's clearly no right way to deliver um, a whole session and it all depends on context, what you're trying to, what the outcomes are and so on. But um, I, I'm, I'm, one, I'm wondering if there's people on this call that might not be so familiar with stuff like the ecological approach, because when we consider coach education in this country, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate enough to go through uh, recently level three uh, in football. And there are some interesting, there's been some interesting stuff around session design. Um, and methodology, but nowhere near to the level of stuff that is out there existing in podcasts and webinars at the moment. So um, I don't know whether Derek or Fletch wants to kick us off with, but maybe a, a brief description of what the ecological approach might be, what constraints of that approach might be, that kind of stuff. Go on, Derek, you can start, but I'll jump in. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks for, uh, thanks for chucking me a hospital pass on that one. Um, so, so really... Uh, uh, really, uh, the ecological approach is looking at a combination of, uh, of ecological psychology and dynamical systems theory uh, to represent uh, the athlete uh, as, um, as a self-organizing system. Um, and we look at uh, the constraints that approach uh, really is around how we might manipulate task uh, environment or person constraints uh, to, um, to create an adaptation uh, within within an athlete's performance or to steer them towards a particular uh, movement solution to, uh, to, uh, to a performance problem. So task constraints could be uh, around the rules of the game. Uh, it could be around uh, set conditions uh, in practice. It could be around size of equipment. Uh, um, uh, environmental constraints could be anything from environmental lighting. It could also be the cultural constraints within the sport. Uh, it could be the size and dimensions of the, of the hall that you're working with. And then very much person constraints is, is what's happening uh, uh, for, that, um, for that individual. So you're looking at uh, their psychological state, um, some stuff around their biology. So you're looking at uh, where they are relative to peak height uh, velocity or uh, how tall they are, how much they weigh, um, uh, how flexible they are, how balanced they are, all, all, things, all things like that. Does, that. does that make sense, Bobby? Is that your... Yeah, yeah, you, you, you nailed it from my understanding anyway, Derek. Um, I mean, I think the interesting thing there is to see if people can pick up on what we're talking about in terms of uh, those, just particularly around the constraint stuff. So the, the person constraints in handboard with pairing up tall players against short players and stuff like that, you know, and you start after starting to maybe uh, reflect on how you're setting up your practices to get the best out of your players. I'm sure coaches do that. I think it's giving them a framework as to um, how they might be able to get better at what they're doing. Fletch, anything to support or, or add to what Derek was saying? Um, mate, well, well done. You definitely explained it better than what I would have. I think the vast majority of, of coaches will be pretty comfortable with using constraints that some of them would probably benefit from understanding actually what, why, what is the purpose. Um, and come back to the original point around this core coaching, I think coaches would benefit from asking each other. So why did you do that? Why did you say that? What were you thinking about that? I actually would have possibly done this. I think they're really comf uh, they're, they're good conversations for coaches to have around constraints. Constraint is basically, you know, as, as has already been said, you're, 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 you're doing something that is a boundary. It's, a, it's going to restrict something. And then what, what, a, what a person or a, or a group of people are going to do is they're going to come up with some solutions to that. So they're going to adapt. So if you, if you change the size of a pitch, you move one side in a little bit, so that's a constraint. Um, so what the, what the individuals are going to do, what the team's going to do is they're going to adapt. Ideally, what we need to do with constraints is not tell everybody what the constraint is. Again, what I've noticed within coaches is, is they're very keen for everybody to know everything all the time. And it probably comes back to the original point around and probably want people to get to the answers a bit quicker, might want it to look a little bit tidier yeah. so i think we're comfortable using constraints my challenge to the game is to really understand why have those conversations as as core coaches and possibly have them with the players at times as well uh, and include the players what constraints would they add to, to make this an even better practice so i think that stuff would be important um yeah that's i mean i know i focused a little bit of a lot around the constraints we actually got danny newcomb who i think is awesome at uh, practice design he's the guy that makes the most sense to me and he actually sent us his top six which i can send to you mate it's a look if there was only six things these would be the things i would look to focus on um 
So I, I, can, I can send that out around constraints. It's definitely something that I reference when I'm coaching. And obviously I'll be using constraints. Um, it's, it's something that I've got in the back of my head. This yeah. sort of, these are things for me to consider when I'm using constraints to try and shift or, um, or, or move behavior or, or, or um, emphasize something or to reinforce something. Yeah, I, th I think that there's there's a couple of there's an important thing I suppose to mention on on constraints and ecological uh, dynamics is that it's still relatively new in the consciousness of coaches and in and in the ether, um, and that can sometimes be really unhelpful when coaches are trying to make sense of uh, of that because there seems to be a um, a burgeoning tribe of people who are starting to adopt the ecological approach. Uh, and I don't pretend to know much about it at all. I mean, I, I've studied it uh, at uni, but uh, I don't have a, a, an in-depth enough knowledge to be able to apply it in practice. Now, I, I like to think uh, through conditioned games or modified games, uh, I am leaning towards uh, an ecological uh, approach or using constraints, but I wouldn't necessarily explicitly say I'm, I'm using a constraints-led approach. Um, I, I suppose the, the other important thing around that is that um, in using CLA or using condition games, they always have to be goal directed. So they always have to be, have a purpose and have a meaning. Uh, what is it that we're trying to achieve with that game rather than just using that game for using the game's sake? Uh, and that's one of the things that I would really advocate around uh, teaching games for understanding or using modified games or condition games. Uh, what, what decision is it that you're trying to promote? Uh, what what, what uh, performance problem are you trying to replicate? What performance solutions are you trying to find? Um, and that coupled with your coaching behaviors around, am I offering performance solutions? So my problem setting, I, am I creating problems or my problem solving? Am I teaching, instructing and giving them my knowledge so that they can then, assuming that they can make that decision on court? Uh, or am I helping them co-construct that knowledge so they're generating that knowledge for themselves uh, so I can have greater confidence in their ability to make that decision on court uh, in the context of competition? Because you, you've got to remember, to, to a certain degree, in a lot of sports, less so in handball, the, the coach has got no control over the performance once the, once the player goes over the, over the whitewash or over the line. Um, now, basketball and, 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 and handball, less so, but uh, we've, got, we've got to trust that what we do during the week is, uh, is enabling players to be able to make those decisions for themselves uh, in the heat of the moment um, uh, on a Saturday or a Sunday. Derek, that's re really interesting, some of the stuff you've mentioned there, and especially leaning on to the competition side of things. We've had a, a question that's been thrown into the chat uh, from Doc, and it's been something that I'm, I've been wrestling with myself the last, uh, well, certainly since we've been on lockdown. And it's um, largely around the, the representativeness of, of our practices and um, how they might influence behaviour and, and, and ultimately performance in a match setting. So that, that transferability, and we alluded to it earlier on in the introduction. Um, I recently read a study uh, from some guys in tennis and they were looking at tennis players in Australia on the, uh, in the youth performance uh, levels and looking at how the representative games that they had designed, um, that they used Hawkeye to monitor player position, um, how hard they hit the ball, strokes that they use, so on. And then they um, observed that against a um, two set match scenario. And they noticed that in the match scenarios, the player's behavior was so much different to how it was in the games uh, that they had designed, the practices that they had designed. And the authors had attributed it towards like risk aversion. So as soon as it went into a match scenario, the players were far less willing to make a mistake and they were playing a lot safer. So they're playing within themselves. So the question from Doc is around how do we create those um, maybe psychological pressure moments in our training sessions that are going to transfer into better decision making on the pitch? Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys have had particular experience in your rugby careers with um, implementing that, those kinds of things. Because we see stuff all the time around consequences. Uh, physical punishments as a result of losing and you know some f uh, maybe funny forfeits that we might have seen and obviously we've everyone's probably got their own stance on on those things but is there anything that you guys could particularly advocate or or, or yeah. direct us towards I, I could probably give a um an example of a practice that that um i uh, i rely upon quite a lot around um how do we how do we transfer effective decision making into into the game context and we we have a, a we practice which is we call it red zone 
uh, we have three balls and we work uh, six minutes nonstop. Uh, as an example, now the the rugby pitch, uh, uh, when you look at it uh, from left to right, is broken up into five meter lines. So a five meter channel uh, on either side, a fifteen meter channel on either side, and then you've got the space in between. And we would go uh, pretty hard where the players had to work uh, continuously in attack or defence for six minutes. And if there was a mistake, there was no chat. It was just rolling on the ball. They had to go to that and play again. Um, so you're talking six minutes of continuous activity, uh, high volume, high contact, high pressure. Uh, and by the end, they're getting really, really fatigued. And what you want to see is some, some effective decision making happening around that point. Now, when the players ask why are we doing that, it's not to flog you. So it's not a physiological effect that I'm looking for, although there is a physiological effect. Technically, tactically, you're going to break down. But what we want to, to, go, to, to get to is when, when your backs are against the wall uh, and you can't necessarily rely on system because we're not, we're not able to get into system quick enough, is what decisions are we going to make to close out a game uh, and, and get the winning points that we need uh, uh, within the dying moments. Those are the kinds of practices that, um, uh, that I, I like to use around uh, applying as much pressure as possible in, in practice um, so that the game becomes easier. I don't know whether or not you've ever used something like that, Fletch, where there's very little in the way of, of conditions. It's just, here's a ball. We're going to go two minutes on the edge, two minutes uh, inside the 15-meter channels, two minutes back out on the edge. And just to see how they respond, we audit some of those decisions on the back end, but we just leave them get on with it for six minutes nonstop. Would you use something like that, Fletch? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My, I, I mean, I think it, it, and you mentioned at the start, it's around your practice design. I think some people, and I'm not accusing anybody who's, or anybody who's written the question, I, I think some people think that they're doing it pretty well. Um, so maybe you just need to have a, you just need to have a look at it. I mean, f sort of train hard, fight easy would be something that I'd be thinking about all the time. Uh, definitely try and, you know, so um, I, I would always be pretty pleased if a player come off and go, well, you know, actually that last five minutes or that moment in the game felt relatively comfortable because we've done it before or we've done something similar and we're, we're able to draw upon it. So I think lots of people are talking about it, scenario this and, you know, in game training and all that. But actually, once you, once you actually get get into it, probably again, get some feedback, maybe use your analyst, or actually give you guys some feedback about, well, what did that look like compared to the game? Um, with the analyst, um, just be mindful of the stuff that you measure. So the players and you as a coach will probably shift your behavior towards the stuff that you think is important. What's the stuff that you're, um, that you're attending to around the stuff that you measure. Another good strategy would be to, uh, again, far too many environments always want to finish well. So we always want to finish on a good one. Uh, I would mix that, that up. I would uh, more than often not finish on something not going well. You're more likely to have some conversations for them to sort it out. Um, so there'd be some strategies around that. Actually, the reverse of that would be, what's the best three or four things happening in this training session? Let's actually re let's actually replay them and really understand why they were so good. So the end of our training sessions, like the highlights, it's you know it's it's sort of the highlights reel. You might want to start your training session based upon something that didn't go well. So how would you actually fix it up? And you haven't had a meeting about it. You haven't spoke about it as a coach. It's just something that you're going to do pretty much straight away. That'll shift their mentality a little bit around sort of being a bit more game-like. Yeah. I, I really like that idea of, uh, of leaving them hungry. So finishing a session where they're really hungry to, uh, to fix what, what's, just, what's just gone wrong. But to some degree, and to use Chris Christian's term, you're almost spitting in their soup at that point to say, well, actually, you, you don't get an opportunity to put that right. Um, off you go and think about why why that was potentially wrong. Um, the video analysis is a really neat point as well. It's just uh, who has autonomy or control or responsibility for for delivering uh, the analysis, and uh, quite often it's the coach or the analyst in front of the room uh, presenting on what they believed to be uh, some of the mistakes or some of the things that we need to shine a light on within the game. Um, the further on I went uh, as a coach certainly within performance programs as we pushed that responsibility back on the athlete and there was a check-in with the coach in advance of the session uh, around was there anything that they believe that they missed rather than uh, us uh, pontificating or professing uh, what it is that we believe to where, where it all went wrong well, what we've got to appreciate is the, 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 the athlete is the expert in the game where the coach might be the expert on the game uh, and there are things that they can see and feel 
uh, and notice uh, in the context of the of the pitch or the court that we can never appreciate because we're not playing uh, and we need to lean in and respond to that and invite that um, that feedback in uh, in order to uh, one go back to self determination theory make the make the athlete feel like they've got a say in 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 how new knowledge or strategy is generated for uh, for them to inform how they might make decisions on court moving on um but also for the for the coach's perspective it's just you might find some really novel solutions to performance problems that you might face again in the future and working with your athletes to uh, to find those solutions i think is much more meaningful than than standing up there and professing to be the the fountain of all knowledge certainly certainly my belief okay so, um, i've got a question um just a bit more practical there's some some of our friends in chile uh, decided to to obviously uh, ask a couple of questions and uh, the question is very basic is um, how would you uh, or when would you uh, start focusing more on decision making in terms of, uh, of the overall uh, preparation of players and this is a question related to age stage more than anything else so um, when would you focus more on this and how what process would you use um, to work to focus on decision making as early as possible um, and uh, now you you won't be asking really sophisticated questions of a six and a seven year old but you can start creating the conditions where asking questions is okay uh, and promoting reflection with your athletes is okay as early as possible uh, because again if you uh, if you look at how chaotic perhaps rugby is uh, early doors um, uh, largely the relationship an athlete has uh, is between themselves and the object uh, and less so between themselves and the space that they've got around them. Uh, and what you want to do as early as possible through asking questions is sensitizing uh, kids to specifying information within the, in the, within the environment that might lead them to do something different to what they are doing right now. Uh, and it's just around um, lifting uh, um, an athlete's line of sight off a football or off a handball or off a rugby ball uh, and uh, looking at the other individuals or the degree of space that they've got available to them uh, beyond beyond the scope of the object, if that if that makes sense. Um, so certainly the um, uh, cognitive development of a of a child uh, largely is focused in on on what they can see and what they can control early on. What we need to do is just is just widen their bandwidth a little bit as early as possible. If, if Fletch, would you agree with that? Or yeah, mate, absolutely. Yeah, um, early on. Uh, as soon as you can, um, the younger the play often, the more creative they are anyway, clearly language. So you would just, the only thing you would adapt would be your language really. Um, um, so yeah, all, all of that stuff would be, I mean, basically what feeds decision-making. Um, so if you just think of this decision-making thing as this, as, as this, but what feeds it is, is awareness. So I think what you're talking about, Derek, and maybe jump in if it's not is, um, clearly, what we're trying to do with the with with everybody is just build their awareness, give them more information so they can make better decisions. Because awareness is a posh word for information. So, um, right from the start, you're trying to build their awareness. Often, their focus when they're younger is around the what's kind of in front of them and the stuff that's important to them. Often, the ball or often the goal. So it's so the the, the things with the younger players is you just probably need them to stir. And that's why things such as freezes and actually maybe some constraints where they can and can't go are actually useful because it, it just gives them a just gives them a different perspective. You're, you're building their awareness, i.e., you're giving them some more info, not giving them, but they're they're drawn upon more information to help their decision making process. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I think there's, 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 sorry, Derek. I was just going to say there's one there's one there's one more point to that in that um, decisions don't come from nowhere; they come from a knowledge base. Um, and there is a time and a place when we m might need to teach or might need to instruct. Uh, and actually, that, that, um, we shouldn't shy away from the fact that we need, we need to also perhaps provide some degree of a knowledge base or a resource base uh, to which uh, players can draw upon uh, as they continue to construct new knowledge, uh, but also how, they, how they're making decisions uh, uh, really early on. So um, although we say the X's and O's is everything, the X's and O's are still, still bloody important in, in developing the knowledge base in order to make effective decisions. That's great. I was just about to ask that question, Derek, around you know, the underpinning knowledge that the player might have to support their decisions. 
Um, and I think, you know, largely what you guys are talking about there is just finding that balance of, of how much we are maybe spending on passing techniques or um, in isolation compared to how we might put it across in, you know, especially for young kids into game-like scenarios. And uh, the stuff that we were talking about before is the coaches being willing to actually release control and accept it might be a bit messy, it might be a bit chaotic, but the kids are actually going to be gaining lots and lots of skills out of that so the awareness stuff is probably developing faster than their ability to throw the ball from a to b um for example um maybe at a quicker rate i don't know yeah there's some additional stuff so uh, uh, this is a definite and so an and would be um just highlight people who are doing it well so you know everybody go and touch the person who does this well or you think's doing it the best and then actually get them to possibly explain. So, so Bobby, why are you doing this well? Um, or what's the stuff I've noticed that you're doing well? So I completely agree. Coaches should not shy away with a coaching tool is tell, inform, instruct. That is, that is in our coaching tool bag, 100%. And if there's some constraints around whether it be time or, well, or, or there'd be some also, well, that's, that's a really good tool. That is, that is the best tool for this job. Um, however, there would be some other tools in there as well. So again, I think the best coaches I've noticed, um, A, have a tool bag where they've got quite a lot of stuff in, but they just bring out the appropriate thing. You know, they're trying to knock a nail in with a hammer. They're not using a screwdriver. Um, but yeah, mate, there's, there's lots of ways, but I don't think we should shy away from coaches where we, we may actually instruct and inform and, uh, and or demonstrate, you know, so sometimes. You know, you might just, as a, as somebody who at this moment in time is a better performer than him, actually, actually um, perform something so they can actually see it and copy it and try it. Yeah, and I, 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 I loved what you said, Fletch, about um, running to or touching the person who's 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 best at at, at this skill. Uh, I wrote a blog recently uh, around uh, my experience as a parent watching my son explore an indoor skate park for the first time. And it kind of leans on social learning theory to an extent. So as a parent, I wasn't allowed on the, uh, on the, um, or in the skate park. Uh, and so I watched my five-year-old boy uh, approach uh, eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds to ask them how they perform certain tricks. Uh, and what, what, what that, what that, what, what's beginning to resonate is uh, to what extent do we allow the space for players to ask other players how it is that they performed a certain task or why they why they why they made a certain decision. So, what why do we as the coach always have to be the one that speaks, uh, and why don't we create the conditions through which uh, some of our uh, more more adept athletes players uh, are the ones who are teaching the less adept uh, uh, around what it is they need to to do to perform the task or perform the skill, or perform a tactic or perform a system, or within a system a little bit better. And it yeah, leans, I mean, into, leans into that social learning theory. Right, yeah, that's awesome. And um, I'm definitely going to copy this because I'm going to clip that bit. Um, so uh, we actually asked, asked the players. So, so we had the players and we said, Look, we, we just want you to share who you feel are the best coaches here. So they thought they meant the grown-ups. So when we, when we actually awesome. sat down and explored what coaching was, actually we didn't get in the top 10. So me and Rusty didn't get in the top 10, which was a big <laughs> shock to Rusty. Um, but I, I mean, they would say, well, actually, Marcus Smith would be a real good coach around ball movement because I just observe him and have conversations with him. So um, you've got unbelievable coaches in your environment and they happen to be your players. Um, now yeah, it's I a, love that. You, you know, it's a, it's a question of do we then have the skills to support the players bringing out so i'll always remember a guy called max malins uh, he, he's about to break through as a standoff for uh, saracens and he i asked him to describe what he sees and what he's thinking around defense and honestly it was uh, he went into um some detail and some information that i hadn't even thought about and this kid was 17 years of age it was like wow that was just amazing guys just on that point and i might be way off piece here, but it got me thinking around um, coach athlete relationships and power dynamics and why the players might be more receptive to information from their teammates than from the coach. Have you guys got any uh, insight into into those 
can, uh, I don't know, the way that players would take information from a coach compared to a player? Have you guys experienced that? I mean, you've clearly given examples of where it's been important. but Yeah, I suppose it, it's just the nature in which um, uh, power exists or uh, how power is perceived within that environment. Um, so uh, there's there, if I, if I tr- describe three different types of power to you at the moment, so you have a uh, legitimate power. Um, so uh, that might be, uh, say, a new coach that comes into the environment. Um, they've got legitimate power because the coaches don't, or the athletes don't necessarily know who he is, so they just assume that this this person has power and they respond to that power, right? Uh, there's a, there's expert power, so somebody has a degree of, of power simply because they are an expert in or they're really knowledgeable in in a certain sphere uh, or within a certain subject or discipline. But then there's one that, that uh, around referent power, which is um, it, my interpretation is likability, right? Uh, it's respect. Uh, and generally the coaches who uh, are the most successful ones are the ones that have that referent power. Um, and the reason why athletes may lean into uh, other athletes more often uh, is simply because of uh, the social structures that exist around them as peers. Um, uh, and it makes them more approachable when they're wanting to to understand stuff. I think Anissa pointed to that a little bit around constructivism, and we talk about zone of proximal learning. Um, and actually, who who is it we're looking to to make sense of or or to do any sort of uh, learning whatsoever? I think uh, by and large, we we look to people who know more than us um, uh, to to do that. Now, if there's a if there's a power dynamic between a coach and an athlete where the coach doesn't feel like they respect or the athlete doesn't feel like they respect or buy into what the coach is about then they look to their their peers uh, uh, for that learning so just just picking up on that point um, and that that again that's my own interpretation don't don't necessarily take that as true interesting uh, Fletch you must have come across this stuff in your time um, I'm honest, I wouldn't have that much to add on that to be honest I think that was a real good summary of the yeah cool uh, Ricardo have we got any more questions in the chat box uh, we have a couple of comments. Um, Anissa says, um, in that sense, if you think that, that constructivism, um, as in developing own skills using a more knowledgeable other, is more important, that I guess goes um, towards the question you've just made, Bobby. Um, other than that, there's not a lot of questions. No, okay. uh, guys have been more posting comments. Sure. Yeah. Questions in that sense. Uh, just, um, just, just on that, I, I don't think, um, I don't think constructivism is more important than anything else. Uh, uh, in the same way, I don't think behaviorism or cognitivism is is more important than anything else. Uh, the approach that you lean into uh, is in response to a moment of need. Um, so, what do the athletes need from you right now? Uh, and to some extent, based on, let's say, for example, you've just your three weeks in a camp, uh, an EHF tournament somewhere, and the players are absolutely goosed. They are really tired. They're cognitively, they're absolutely depleted. Physically, they're absolutely ruined. What they don't want at that point is to engage in, uh, in a session that's underpinned by constructivist learning theory because it's going to have no impact. At that point, they may want you to teach and instruct. Uh, and that, that, is the, that is the skill of the coach to recognize uh, understand and be sensitized to what the needs of the athlete are uh, at there and then and meeting them where they are does that does that make sense so i, w- I wouldn't i wouldn't advocate one approach over the other uh, to quote dave collins it really depends yeah it's a a, a great uh, nod to to dave there derek thanks mate um the we've, we've got a couple of questions or um colleague of mine, John Pierce, has thrown a question into the group, which we might save just for a little bit. Um, I'm going to open up the poll again. Um, often in these chats, we've been asked for, um, have we got any examples, any, any, uh, any inverted commas, drills, any practices that we can use? So I'm going to open up the, uh, the, the poll, and you guys can um, vote on the, the most um, common issues around decision-making in attack and in defence. And then when we've got those results in, Ricardo and I might work together to produce something and send it out in the, in the um, debrief email that goes out on this. So I'm going to open up the poll now. Guys, while we're talking about the next thing, feel free to um, go ahead of that poll. So the poll is now open. Um, this is probably more of a, a, a sum up kind of question for you, Derek and, and, and Fletch. Um, so JP asks, 
Uh, what are the key things you wouldn't do? So top three things you wouldn't do, top three things that you would try and maybe share in your best coaching mistake. I know Fletch, you've shared this with us, with England Handball before, but um, maybe we can reduce it to top two um, on those things. So two things you wouldn't try and two things you would do. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, so what the three things you wouldn't do? I mean, I just would never assume and I wouldn't have a plan as in a rigid plan. I would have a direction of travel and I know it might just be language, but I wouldn't have lots of stuff that, that I'm assuming is going to happen. So they're kind of linked. I think some of the stuff where I've come unstuck and I've, I've really struggled um, and it possibly hasn't been that effective is, is, where I've, is where I've assumed lots of things that this is going to lead into that. Um, this person is going to behave like this. This is, this is what's going to happen. So what I wouldn't do would be assume. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I'm planning in terms of thinking and possibly writing some stuff down and noticing some stuff. Um, I, I just, I wouldn't have any real massive detail to what I think is going to happen would be stuff around did, didn't. What's the stuff to try? I know Rusty was on a few weeks ago around the digital video game stuff. I would just go and throw yourself into it a bit. See, see, see what bits of it can be really helpful. Um, so that's the stuff that I would try. Um, was there any other question, mate? Sorry, I'm trying to read it. I kind of so your, your best, your, uh, your top coaching mistake. Oh yeah, the best uh, coaching mistake would be around some individuals who I have I've just got wrong. So I've assumed I've made an again I've made an assumption based upon some information. I've probably then really worked hard to feed my own biases, um, and yeah, I've just got it wrong. So again, it would come back to and it's quite it's quite a broad subject around really getting to understand the person in front of you, um, and probably not the one that presents itself to you. So actually. You know, work hard. Don't just take it when I see this person or this team and they're in, they're presenting themselves in front of me, because they're likely to behave in a way that's going to be helpful for them getting selected, or or how they feel you want them to behave. So really, find out some information that sort of fits around the person would be the stuff that uh, I've. I mean, I've I've got that wrong a few times. Cool. Um, just on some of the stuff you mentioned there, uh, Fletch, because this might I don't know if it conflicts or not, but um, some of the work that myself and Ricardo did with um, Bob Muir and Andy Abrahams at Leeds Beckett and some stuff that we've listened to Ed Hall speak about the other day was around this imagined future and expectations so you've okay. said about not having assumptions but is there a difference between assumptions and expectations of, of uh, your session? Yeah there is and again, I mean I've, I mean, I've learned so much from Ed and, and, and hanging out I'm fortunate that he lives in the area and if, you, if people haven't listened to Ed's talk, he's been on a number of things. I think it would be worth it. It, it, it would be worthwhile. He's got, um, he's got some interesting views. Um, so Fletch, I've, Fletch, I've got the video. Would you mind if I shared that with our... Absolutely, mate. And anything that's on Magic is, is yours, mate. You can share cool. anything. If you think any of the podcasts, any stuff would be useful, then Thanks. sort of share them. Cool. Go on, go on, Derek. I'm I'm curious to hear yours, mate. What's the stuff that you wouldn't do, and what's your best? Yeah, a pretty pretty heavy question to finish with, JP. So thanks very much for that. <laughs> uh, top three things that I wouldn't do. I, I I would never assume that I'm finished. Uh, in in terms of learning as a coach, I think uh, one thing we need to recognise as a coach is that we're perpetually unfinished. Uh, our view, the way in which we view the world, and the way in which we view coaching, is constantly in flux. So it will always change. Uh, and what I would say is that um, be conscious of that, be aware of that, and be willing to change with it. Um, I, I will never assume that I know more than anybody else. Um, there's always something that you can learn from people, uh, irrespective of the level that they're at within the pathway uh, or the stage of the pathway in which they work at. There's things that I can learn from uh, really good kids coaches uh, in the same way that I can learn from adult coaches. Um, uh, and uh, I suppose the other thing... Uh, uh, that I wouldn't do is, is uh, <laughs> this might sound a bit uh, contradictory, but I would, I would try and avoid bringing my opinions to, to the coaching environment. Uh, I've got some pretty strong opinions on, uh, on uh, what coaching effectiveness is or, or where coaching could be, but I need to learn to leave those opinions at the door um, uh, because my job is to meet people where they are and not necessarily to present a view or defend a view of what I believe coaching to be. Um, oh, uh, 
my big my biggest co- to- coaching mistake. Uh, assuming that I could change people, I think number one, um, and it, it probably ties into what uh, Fletch was saying around is just see the human in other in other people. But one of my biggest mistakes as a coach is never showing in my athletes uh, the human in me. Uh, I think uh, too often we we can put ourselves on a pedestal or distance ourselves from athletes, but uh, they want to see the human in us as much as we want to see the human in them. So don't be afraid to share who you are with your athletes. I think that was probably one of the biggest mistakes I made earlier on. Awesome. Thanks, Derek. Um, just one more thing, and it's it's JP again who's asked um, maybe around the, the answers you guys have given have been, have been awesome and very much around how you behave. And the stuff that he's asking now is more around how you, the stuff that you would just avoid in session from a probably a, a task design setup. So he's asking around the physical physical punishment for I say punishment, but physical consequences. So you know, a lap around a pitch, for example. I mean, it, uh, that, that, or, serves, that, that that serves no purpose other than uh, to lose respect uh, and relatedness with the athletes. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think uh, punishing people for for making a wrong decision is is wrong because it stops people from making a decision full stop. Yeah. Uh, and actually, we should uh, we should celebrate people um, being brave enough to make decisions in the context of of training or or, or the competition environment, uh, irrespective of the outcome. Uh, uh, the only the only wrong decision is the one that you don't make. Um, I think uh, the the one the one thing I would I would advocate for is. Uh, try and make uh, training look as as messy as dynamic uh, and as active as possible um, rather than settling in on uh, structured drills and practices and lines Uh, if you can design uh, for the same learning intention through a a messy game uh, or messy practice uh, then I would advocate that over trying to drill something uh, repetitively uh, uh, by laying out uh, a very intricate sequence of cones and trying to get people to move through them. Awesome. Thanks, Derek. That's great. Fletch, anything to add, mate? Yeah, mate, just really quickly. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd think about the start of your session. Try, try and sort of take off where you left the last one. Far too often sessions sort of finish up here somewhere, often with the, often with the, the most helpful stuff. And then we start the next session down here. And we, so sort of our learning opportunities go like that. I would make them... Um, so yeah, I would try and finish. So he's trying to start the session kind of way. Well, actually, uh, let's use the word harder. But um, so I'm going to use it harder than where you finished, and then just notice the stuff that's going to be helpful. Far too often the sessions start with like like one on one passing or two and two passing or a little game that's not that challenging type stuff. So try and make it really dynamic. Quite difficult lots of lots of problems in at the start and then just work through it with the team and just think around the words facilitate and guide i think they would probably influence then your behavior i know we talk a lot about behavior as a coach that would awesome. be- um there's two there's two more questions one i know the answer to so uh, doc has asked do you let players have an input on session design i know 100 percent you guys would be well up for co-creating sessions with players and letting them have an input on rule adaptations and stuff like that um so we won't go more into that but this is this again it's from john and john uh, the the webinar was supposed to finish at free mate so if you've got any more questions i'm happy to send them out to the guys and get them uh, to answer separately but um the question is around the the level of players so you've got a group of players that come into your session and this is really kind of common in in the uk so you get uh, you beginning handball player and your guy who's been in the performance pathway for three years playing at the same club um how would you guys i don't know go around supporting the development needs of both individuals so stretching and supporting both of them at the same time is there any any quick take take away from you guys yeah, I mean, you, would, you would probably hook them up pretty early it might even be a secret mission with the person who has a bit more experience so at this moment in time is, is being a bit more effective so maybe sort of give him a, either a secret mission around looking to support the person who's new to it or being a bit more deliberate about it and then actually setting them some sort of challenges around this is the stuff that you're gonna you know that that you're gonna notice about them type stuff yeah. um I, I mean there'd be lots of other stuff that 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 would support the 
differentiation. So, and it happens in all, it doesn't happen as much in terms of the performance side, but it definitely happens within a performance pathway and within the community game that you have quite a lot in terms of the you know, people with different stages. So pairing them up would be some stuff that I would look to do. Um, and then start to notice some stuff that's going to be helpful to them getting better. Yeah. I, I think it's implied within the question that this isn't a performance setting because uh, it's not very often that you're going to have a novice handball player within that performance setting. So you really need to think about what your motivations are as a coach. Are you there to win? Are you there to develop people and players? Um, and there is, uh, I suppose, adding to what, to what Fletch is saying, there's an opportunity for the more experienced player to be developed as a leader uh, and a person uh, and the novice to be developed as a player. Uh, and I think recognising that... Yeah, and leaning on that and leading into social learning theory, I think, uh, is, is, is crucial so that everybody's getting a decent decent outcome within that because um, aesthetically it doesn't matter if practice looks looks perfect. Uh, your job is to, uh, is to work with people to develop uh, uh, as, as people and as players uh, at a pace that's, that, that's right for them. Uh, and you need to recognise that sometimes the training is not always going to look perfect when you take that approach. Awesome, great stuff, guys. Um, I'd ordinarily just uh, ask you guys for your top your top tips anyway, but you you guys have covered that, so I suppose it's just for me to say a big thank you for taking the time out this afternoon to join us. It's been awesome. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of um, mention around some of the underlying theories for from psychology, social learning theory, self determination theory, and stuff. Um, it might be interesting, and maybe we'll send out some links for people to go away and explore that a bit more if they're not familiar. Um, Fletch, Derek, massive, massive thank you. Uh, closing remarks? Uh, just just keep doing what you're doing, Bobby. I'm, I'm really liking uh, watching from afar and seeing how England handball are trying to move uh, coaching practice on. So uh, I suppose full disclosure on my end, I used to work for the Scottish Handball Association. So I have some experience in handball and I'm really liking uh, uh, what I'm seeing in terms of what you're doing to try and to develop your coaches. So so keep doing what you're doing. And thanks very much for the, for the substitute in. Yeah, Bobby. It was really nice to get. Yes, Derek. Appreciate it, mate. Um, mate yeah, look, I, I mean, from my point of view, yeah, it's, yeah, I've made as many notes as anybody else. I, uh, I, I think from a coaching point of view, just stay curious. Um, probably be a bit more vulnerable to getting people in to sort of share some feedback and some thoughts and some stuff that you're doing well and, and all that sort of stuff. I'm still not seeing enough of it. I'm still seeing quite a lot of coaches who are probably far too mindful around that type of stuff. So, yeah, so stay curious. Keep learning. Awesome. Fletch, thank you so much. Derek, thank you so much. Guys, thank you for joining us. I hope you are all safe and well wherever you are. We are on Friday with Ricardo Vasconcelos presenting his ideas around 4-2 defence. Uh, don't miss it. Uh, we'll send out the links for that uh, if you haven't already got it. Guys, thank you so much and all the best. Bye-bye. Cheers, mate. Guys, Bye -bye. Sam.